Hello, everybody. It is Monday, January 11th. We are starting our new class novel, Maniac McGee by Jerry Spinelli. <clears throat> we are going to read the before the story and chapters one through three today. As a lot of authors do, Mr. Spinelli dedicated this to Ray and Jerry Lincoln. All right, here we go. Maniac McGee, before the story. They say Maniac McGee was born in a dump. They had, say his stomach was a cereal box and his heart a sofa spring. They say he kept an eight-inch cockroach on a leash and that rats stood guard over him while he slept. They say if you knew he was coming and you sprinkled salt on the ground and he ran over it within two or three blocks, he would be as slow as everybody else, they say. What's true? What's myth? It's hard to know. Finsterwald's gone now, yet even today you'll never find a kid sitting on the steps where he once lived. The Little League field is still there, and the band shell. Cobble's Corner still stands at the corner of Hector and Birch, and if you ask the man behind the counter, he'll take the clump of string out of a drawer and let you see it. Grade school girls and two mills still jump rope and chant, Maniac, maniac, he's so cool. Maniac, maniac, don't go to school. Runs all night, runs all right. Maniac, maniac, kissed a bull. And sometimes the girl holding one end of the rope is from the west side of Hector, and the girl on the other end is from the east side. And if you're looking for Maniac McGee's legacy or monument, that's as good as any, even if it wasn't really a bull. But that's okay, because the history of a kid is one part fact, two parts legend, and three parts snowball. And if you want to know what it was like back when Maniac McGee roamed these parts, well, just run your hand under a movie seat and be very, very careful not to let the facts get mixed up with the truth. All right, here we go. Part one, chapter one. Maniac McGee was not born in a dump. He was born in a house, a pretty ordinary house, right across the river from here in Bridgeport. And he had regular parents, a mother and a father, but not for long. One day, his parents left him with a sitter and took the P&W high-speed trolley into the city. On the way back home, they were on board when the P&W had its famous crash, when the motorman was drunk and took the high trestle over the Schaikel River at 60 miles an hour, and the whole caboodle took a swan dive into the water. So the P&W would be like a subway or maybe a trolley, something like that. And apparently it crashed or could be a train. And just like that, Maniac was an orphan. He was three years old. Of course, to be accurate, he wasn't really Maniac then. He was Jeffrey, Jeffrey Lionel McGee. Little Jeffrey was shipped off to this nearest relatives, Aunt Dot and Uncle Dan. They lived in Hollidaysburg in the western part of Pennsylvania. Aunt Dot and Uncle Dan hated each other, but because they were strict Catholics, they wouldn't get a divorce. Around the time Jeffrey arrived, they stopped talking to each other. They stopped sharing. Pretty soon, there were two of everything in the house. Two bathrooms, two TVs, two refrigerators, two toasters. If it were possible, they would have had two Jeffreys. As it was, they split him up as best they could. For instance, he would eat dinner with Aunt Dot on Monday, with Uncle Dan on Tuesday, and so on. Eight years of that. Then came the night of the spring musical at Jeffrey's school. He was in the chorus. There was only one show and one auditorium. So Aunt Dot and Uncle Dan were forced to share at least that much. Aunt Dot sat on one side, Uncle Dan on the other. Jeffrey probably started screaming from the start of the song, which was Talk to the Animals. But nobody knew it because he was drowned out by all the other voices. Then the music ended and Jeffrey went right on screaming, his face bright red by now, his neck bulging. The music director faced the singers, frozen with his arms still raised. In the audience, faces began to change. Excuse me. There was a quick smatter of giggling by some people who figured the screaming kid was some part of the show, some funny animal maybe. Then the giggling stopped, and the eyes started to shift, and heads started to turn. Because now everybody could see that this wasn't part of the show at all, that little Jeffrey McGee wasn't supposed to be up there, 
on the risers, pointing to his aunt and uncle, bellowing out from the midst of the chorus. Talk, talk, will you? Talk, talk, talk. No one knew it then, but it was the birth scream of a legend. And that's when the running started. Three springy steps down from the risers, girls in pastel dresses screaming, the music director lunging, a leap from the stage, out the side door and into the starry, sweet, onion grass smelling night. Never again to return to the house of two toasters. Never again to return to school. So he was in a music or performance and uh, apparently did not want to be. Chapter two. Everybody knows that Maniac McGee, then Jeffrey, started out in Holidaysburg and wound up in two mills. The question is, what took him so long? And what did he do along the way? Sure, 200 miles is a long way, especially on foot. But the year that it took him to cover was about 51 weeks more than he needed, figuring the way he could run even then. The legend doesn't have the answer. That's why this period is known as the lost year. And another question, why did he stay here? Why two mills? Of course, there's the obvious answer that's sitting right across the Schreichel, I think that's how you say it, Schreichel in Bridgeport, where he was born. Yet there are other theories. Some say he just got tired of running. Some say it was the butterscotch crimpets. And some say he only intended to pause here, but that he stayed because he was so happy to make a friend. If you listen to everybody who claims to have seen Jeffrey Maniac McGee that first day, there must have been 10,000 people in a parade of fire trucks waiting for him at the town limits. Don't believe it. A couple of people truly remember, and here's what they saw. A scraggly little kid jogging toward them, the soles of both sneakers hanging by their hinges and flopping open like dog tongues each time they came up from the pavement. But it was something they heard that made him stick to their minds all these years as he passed them. He said, hi, just that, hi, and he was gone. They stopped, they blinked, they turned, they stared after him, they wondered, do I know that kid? Because people just didn't say that to strangers out of the blue. Chapter three. As for the first person to actually, actually stop and talk with Maniac, that would be Amanda Beal. And it happened because of a mistake. It was around eight in the morning and Amanda was heading off for grade school like hundreds of other kids all over town. What made Amanda different was that she was carrying a suitcase and that's what caught Maniac's eye. He figured she was like him running away, so he stopped and said, hi. Amanda was suspicious. Who was this white stranger kid? And what was he doing in the East End where almost all the kids were black? And why was he saying that? But Amanda Beale was also friendly, so she stopped and said, hi, back. Are you running away? Jeffrey asked her. Huh? said Amanda. Jeffrey pointed at the suitcase. Amanda frowned, then thought, then laughed. She laughed so hard she began to lose her balance, so she set the suitcase down and sat on it so she could laugh more safely. When at last she could speak, she said, I'm not running away. I'm going to school. She saw the puzzlement on his face. She got off the suitcase and opened it right there on the sidewalk. Just Jeffrey gasped, books. Books, all right. Both sides of the suitcase crammed with them, dozens more than anyone would ever need for homework. Jeffrey fell to his knees. He and Amanda and the suitcase were like a rock in a stream. The schoolgoers just flowed to the left and right around them. He turned his head this way and that way to read the titles. He lifted the books on top to see the ones beneath. There were fiction books and nonfiction books, who did it books and let's be friends books and what is it books and how to books and how not to books and just regular kid books. On the bottom was a single volume from an, an encyclopedia. It was the letter A. My library, Amanda Beale said proudly. Somebody called, going to be late for school, girl. Amanda looked up. The street was almost deserted. She slammed the suitcase shut and started hauling it along. Jeffrey took the suitcase from her. I'll carry it for you. Amanda's eyes shot wide. She hesitated, then snatched it back. Who are you, she said. Jeffrey McGee. Where are you from? West End? No. She stared at him, at the flap-soled sneakers. Back in those days, the town was pretty much divided. The East End was blacks and the West End was whites. I know you're not from the East End. I'm from Bridgeport. Bridgeport? Over there? That Bridgeport? 
Yep. Well, why aren't you there? It's where I'm from, not where I am. Great. So where do you live? Jeffrey looked around. I don't know. Maybe here. Maybe. Amanda shook her head and chuckled. Maybe you better go ask your mother and father if you live here or not. She speeded up. Jeffrey dropped back for a second and then caught up with her. Why are you taking all these books to school? Amanda told him. She told him about her little brother and sister at home who loved a crayon on every piece of paper they could find, whether or not it already had type all over it. And about the dog, Bow Wow, who chewed everything he could to get his teeth on. And that she said she, that's why she carried her whole library to and from school every day. First bell was ringing. The school was still a block away. Amanda ran. Jeffrey ran. Can I have a book, he said. They're mine, she said. Just to read, to borrow. No. Please, what's your name? Amanda. Please, Amanda, anyone. Your shortest one. I'm late now, and I'm going to stop and open this thing again. Forget it. He stopped. Amanda. She kept running, then stopped, turned, glared. What kind of kid was this anyway? All grungy, ripped shirt. Why didn't he go back to Bridgeport or the West End where he belonged? Bothersome white girl up there. And why was she still standing there? So what if I loaned you one, huh? How am I going to get it back? I'll bring it back. Honest, if it's the last thing I do, what's your address? 728 Sycamore, but you can't come there. You can't even be here. Second bell rang. Amanda screamed, whirled, and ran. Amanda! She stopped, turned. Oh, she squeaked. She tore a book from the suitcase, hurled it at him. Here! And dashed into school. The book came flapping like a wounded duck and fell at Jeffrey's feet. It was the story of the children's crusade. Jeffrey picked it up, and Amanda Bill was late to school for the only time her life. We'll stop there today with chapter three. So we've met Jeffrey Maniac McGee and he ended up being an orphan and had to go live with his aunt and uncle and apparently that wasn't working out so he ran away. He's now made it to this new town and met Amanda. So I would call Jeffrey and Amanda our two main characters and we'll pick up with Jeffrey and Amanda tomorrow morning around the same time. You guys have a great day. Have a marvelous Monday. Bye.